exciting things. We saw these decks, uh, Liam and I were looking at them ahead of time. Some some really huge similarities, both tempo decks. Uh, both of them have the Curse Merfolk to start out with. They both have Ursula Deceiver and Ursula at the top end as well. Both of them are running friends on the other side and Queen's Castle. But Liam, can you talk a little bit about some of the key differences? Yeah, these decks actually will play quite differently in the early game and in the late game. The mid game will be very similar, but Andrew's deck on the low end runs a couple cards, which Ben doesn't. He does run the four magic brooms in the one drop slot, a card that allows you to dr banish them to draw more cards uh, or another card when another character enters play. He also runs Flynn Rider in the two spot, which means this deck is going to take a little bit more aggression uh, early game when it comes to lore gathering. Um, on the other side in the early game, we have Sir Hisses and Pegasus, two evasive characters, which Andrew doesn't run, but Ben does. And so Ben really relying on some early game evasive characters to try to gather his lore, where Andrew's going to try to be aggressive with the Flynn Riders. In the mid game, some of the differences are um, they each player runs a card to try to get around an opponent's aggressive deck. Ben chooses to run Jacques, a high lore, aggr more aggressive character, um, which can ch give an, a character a reckless for a turn. But then you have Lyle on the other side, which Andrew Krug is running. But a huge difference comes in. In, in the top end, where Andrew has worked in some endgame characters like Don Carnage, Cricky, Lucifer, um, and, and then John Silver. And John Silver. John Silver <laughs> is a card that I think could make a huge difference in this game because it has an enter play effect and then an effect that can trigger every single time that he quests, uh, giving an opponent reckless. And in a game like this where you may be racing, um, that could make a huge difference. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how these decks match up against each other with those differences. And Jacques is a really fun card. And I don't know if you know this, but the voice of Jacques, James McDonald, he was also the voice of Gus and also the voice of of Mickey Mouse and Pluto at the time. Wow, that's quite the range. <laughs> quite a resume, yes. And here we see Andrew starting off with that cursed merfolk. Right, and so uh, one of the things that you were talking about before the match, Becky, is how much the play draw difference is going to make a, uh, have a huge difference here in this matchup, mm -hmm. and Andrew being the higher seed gets to play first. And mm -hmm. so in a three-game matchup, if it goes to three games, Andrew's going to have two chances uh, to be the player that goes first. Both these players are going to want to drive the tempo. They want to get to early leads, forcing their opponent to respond to their side of the board rather than pursuing lore themselves. And so uh, dropping a cursed merfolk on the board in the early game is something that both players would be happy with. Um, and Andrew going wide here, I think this is a great turn one, two for him. Yeah, that Cursed Mother Folk, so powerful. And then, yeah, going like wide, like you said. Uh, that evasive, though, on the other side with Ben, and you mentioned earlier a couple other evasive cards that he has. And what answers does Andrew have for those evasive cards? Mm, not many. Um, the, the problem with these Emerald Amethyst decks, something we've talked about before, there's not a lot of removal. You do have bounce cards available, although mm -hmm. neither player is playing Mother Knows Best. They both are running the Kit Cloud Kickers, which can slow down your opponent's tempo. But these are removal options that, or that's a removal option that just delays a card, and it, although it does hit your opponent back. The other thing both players have as far as like answers are cards that give their opponent's characters reckless, like Jock, like John Silver, and like uh, Lyle, Tiberius Rourke. Mm -hmm. uh, these are cards which can slow down your opponent and force them to perhaps challenge into one of your characters and remove themselves. The only other big removal answer um, for any character is the is the Fox, which is a rush character. Um, but as far as early evasives, to answer your very specific <laughs> question, there's not a lot early game other than perhaps dropping a Jock on turn three, which can force an evasive character to challenge into something it doesn't want to. Yeah, which Andrew is running Lyle, but Ben is running Jacques. So it, yeah, there's so many cards that give Reckless. And Reckless, for players who may not know, it's a keyword that uh, a character must challenge when able and that they cannot quest. So Andrew choosing to banish his broom there in order to draw a card um, and getting a fox in play. And uh, definitely setting up a bigger board state here. He does have a castle in hand. Yeah. Uh, th that is a, a card he, I think he's happy to drop. Uh, so, And also another difference here, we see a Maleficent played on Ben's side of the board. This is a card that's been around since set one. It allows you to draw a card when played. Uh, ben runs these in the, in the mid for the um, early game card draw, um, and Andrew does not. Now, he did ink a Friends on the Other Side and chose to play Maleficent. I know that Friends on the Other Side can be such a powerful card with drawing two. What do you think is the choice there to ink it and play Maleficent instead? I mean, board presence is going to be such a big deal for, for this game. Who can get characters to stick on the board um, in order to pursue their win condition? And so uh, the, the one character on the board seems to be more important to Ben here rather than um, saving that friend to play it. Uh, although I didn't take a look at the rest of his hand, it could be that there's an uninkable problem. Um, 
I, I haven't gotten to see yet what else he has. Yeah, over on Andrew's side, he is choosing to ink the Queen's castle. And probably for the same reason that you're saying that, that Ben inked friends on the other side, is they're really both of them trying to develop their board presence. Mm. And there's that reckless. Yes, I mean, you asked what the answer is to the evasive characters at the, in the early game here. It's give that character reckless um, and force it to do something or to challenge into one of your characters, which uh, you don't want to. In this case, a fox. Yeah, ba baby Pegasus is going to have to challenge that fox. And uh, he says, well, we might as well take Maleficent into that fox too and at least banish her off the board. Mm. And that is that is the answer. Yes. <laughs> I think what will be interesting about this game is like we talked about in a previous round, is knowing when you are going to be the aggressor and when are, you're the one that's going to have to um, have the answers to stop your your opponent. And that's going to be a lot of back and forth, I think, between these two players. Yes. No, that's exactly right. And here we get a look at the hand here. There are no songs available. Um, so you asked earlier why ink friends from the other side. That is another potential reason. Um, sometimes when you're playing against decks where you know they have Deceiver, you yeah. choose to send that card into your inkwell if you're not going to play it right away because you know it can easily be picked. Sure, and you would rather it be ink than be in your discard pile. Absolutely, and oftentimes this uh, this Maleficent into Friends from the Other Side combo is a tale as old as time with Morgana. Yes. It yes. came in the very first starter <laughs> decks, and so once you get a three-cost character on the board and Friends from the Other Side is available to be sung, that's the perfect time to play an Ursa Deceiver to pick that from your opponent's hand, and that is likely why, or probably a good reason why that Friends went into the inkwell rather than being played. Yes, and that is the only song that both players actually have in their deck. They both are running four copies of Friends on the Other Side, no other songs. So that's really the only thing that Ursula would be able to pick out of their hand. Yeah, so what, another card I want to talk about here is, is Merlin Rabbit. Um, both of these decks have low to the ground openings uh, where they have a lot of one, two, and three cost characters. And so in this particular build, you have the possibility of running through your hand very quickly and being in top deck mode very early. And so getting a rabbit online in the middle of the game, particularly a rabbit, if you can bounce it a time or two, like mm -hmm. I think we may see here, um, really charges your hand going into the late game. And yep. there it is. And there it is. And so as you watch both this game and the next game play out, and then a game three if we get one, um, you're going to see that whichever player managed to make maximum use of the rabbit in the mid game is likely the one that has an edge going into the end game. And Andrew does not have his rabbit online. He has just a crab and curse merfolk in hand, uh, only down to two cards. I think both players have pretty low hands and needing to find a, a way to get some more cards in his hands. And he drew into a uh, Flynn Rider, which is a great card for questing, um, but not going to give him the card draw that he needs at this point in the game. Yeah, another card. Let's talk real quick. Um, we do have an advantage with the rabbit on Ben's side, but that Lyle Tiberius Fork. Um, is such a devastating card for Ben in this matchup because what we're likely to see as these games go on, it, it's going to be a lore race at some point um, in one of these games. And it does look like Andrew, though, may, may end up pushing this really quickly towards 20. But um, in a lore race, work sitting there on the board not exerting, just sitting there all game and forcing your opponent to lose a lore every single time one of their characters is, is banished in a challenge. And we're going to see a lot of that. Um, it's really going to suppress Ben's uh, ability to accumulate lore. It's it's a devastating card to have sitting across from the board from you in this matchup. Sure. So if anyone doesn't know, Lyle Tiberius Rourke, um, who's from Atlantis, the, one of the villains in Atlantis, whenever one of your own characters is banished, then your opponent, each opponent, loses one lore. So that means that Lyle could kind of hang out there without questing or challenging, and any other characters that he might lose would, um, oh, or you could force them to exert. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Ursula came down and said, uh, it's time Ursula took matters into her own tentacles, forced Tiberius Rourke to exert, and then Ben was able to use Madame Mim Fox to banish Rourke. Yeah, what a great, great answer here. We talked about the fact that there's not much removal uh, in these decks, and uh, this is one of the answers you don't see terribly often, because Ursula is a very expensive card. It doesn't get me to play in the late game, unless you have Deceiver to shift onto. Um, what a great answer here, and this really, really swung the board state. Yeah, uh, Andrew's still having both those flins out. He has a lot of lore on the board right now. Let's see, Ursula does quest for three, though. 
and she has seven willpower, a very large body for Andrew to deal with. He does have a crab in hand still, I believe, so that is something that he could look at using to increase the strength of one of his characters to run into Ursula perhaps later. Yeah, I mean, that really is the best answer for Ursula, as we talked about, just not a lot of uh, targeted removal. Um, and so in the, in this particular build, in this particular deck, in these color combos, so the crab is is kind of the biggest answer to a high willpower character like that. But here we see it played to the board. Uh, it, it's going to be, it, it does provide some utility if you can bounce it or when it's banished in a challenge. So um, sometimes players think the best way to use the crab is to wait and to play it to board and give extra strength when it comes into play. But here you have a scenario where if Ursula exerts uh, to quest and get that three lore, the crab can challenge Ursula and when it is banished, it's removed from play, then making one of the other characters stronger, able to finish off Ursula. Um, in a challenge. But Ursula is, oh, the character quest, Ursula's gonna exert the crab here, and we're gonna see it removed by Sir Hiss, Oof. then knowing that that is, that is the answer. Yeah, it's, it's whenever this character quests, then you can exert chosen character, and my goodness, yeah. It seems like every plan that Andrew has here, uh, Ben is able to come in and thwart those plans. But Ben is still in the driver. I was going to say Ben is still in the driver's seat at this point with six lore on the board, pushing up to 17. Uh, but here's another removal option. This is one of the differences between these two decks, Peter Pan Shadow Hunt Finder. Um, this is a rush and evasive character, but the rush is going to come into play here, uh, forcing uh, not only uh, banishing Flynn Rider, but forcing Ben to discard a card upon the challenge. Yep, so he did choose to banish a Flynn Rider, which, of course, the ability on Flynn is that when he is challenged, you must discard a card. And so he w did discard one of his Merlin Crabs into the discard pile. That is a another interesting difference between these two decks. I believe that, is it Andrew only has two and Ben has four Crabs that he's running? Uh, that is correct. That is correct. Yes. Yeah, Ben has, has four uh, Crabs. Gosh, what a great match so far. You know, when we started this match, we highlighted that one of the big differences between these decks is there's several differences in terms of the early game aggression. Andrew is, is the more aggressive deck with the Flynn Riders. But one thing that Ben has uh, more of is this, are these mid-game control options, including Jacques and Peter Pan's Shadow. Mm -hmm. And you see those two cards making a difference here, being used to, to great effect um, to narrow down, winnow down Andrew's side of the board. Yeah, and Andrew also hasn't been able to draw a lot of cards. He's sitting here with just one card in hand, I believe. Yes. Do we know what that is? Uh, not. I don't think we do. Jacques. Yeah, Jacques is a really fun card. He also quests for two. I really like that little mouse. And um, I love how his art pairs with Gus, too. The art lines up in the background, which is really fun. I love any continuous art that we get in the game. We do. We should, uh, we should get Gus on the other side oh. and show that. <laughs> uh, but here we have uh, another crab coming into play giving Jacques Challenger three. Ursula questing to exert the fox. The fox, yes. And yeah, Seems like we'll see Jacques challenging in. Yeah, really, Ben is just finding every answer to every card that Andrew has on the board. Yeah, Ben, ben is realized he has the advantage in terms of board state, and he also, uh, does he have any cards in hand? Or it doesn't look like it. So we had Cursed Merfolk, and then that rabbit that we just saw played. Ah, drawing into that Ursula now on Andrew's side. As we talked about, that's one key uh, similarity between these two decks is they both do have that Floodborne Ursula. Yeah, happy to draw into that rabbit. It, it is a card that will give him a couple cards in the mid-game here. We do need to get some more ink in the inkwell, um, inking the Ursula, playing the Cursed Merfolk. I mean, Andrew, even though his board state is low, this is the phase of the game where he's hoping to get two lore per turn, just drop a character, quest, drop a character, quest, forcing Ben to respond and putting you in goat striking range. Unfortunately, that Ursula is just yeah. so devastating. Allowing her to exert a character really prevents... An you know, normally you play a character, and you can generally, unless you're playing against Steel or something, <laughs> Yeah. Remove it. You could generally count on it questing next turn before being removed, but that Ursula is just forcing everything uh, to exert itself. Yep. Big, bad, beautiful Ursula doing her worst here for Andrew. <laughs> is it, is it um, ironic that, that or appropriate that Ursula exerted the cursed merfolk? Yes, I think so. <laughs> very, very appropriate. 
Uh, Andrew here looking for some cards, putting a little bit of damage on Ursula to banish the rabbit, and that's it looks like it's it. Andrew I think just... Andrew said, I don't have any more answers for Ben's side of the board, so Ben takes game one. Wow. I... Man, yeah, this game matchup is was so interesting watching them go back and forth. And congratulations to Ben on game one. But the round still could go Andrew's way. Players are altering their hands. Let's actually talk a little bit about that. Because of those differences, what are each of these players looking for in their opening hands? I mean, the play draw here is huge and is going to change how each one of these players crafts their hands. If you are on the draw in this game, if you're not playing first, you're looking for cards like Andrew has in his hand. You're looking for those cloud kickers. Um, you're looking for Jacques, you're looking for things that can stall your opponent's momentum because you can count on your opponent trying to be aggressive early, playing cards like Cursed Merfolk, uh, Flynn Rider if you're running it, and trying to race out ahead. So you need to find cards uh, in this that are going to slow your opponent's tempo and allow you to turn the corner and become the aggressor. If you're on the play, you're kind of doing the opposite, and you're looking for those aggressive cards. You want you know, perhaps a Cursed Merfolk early game, or in Ben's case, Ben runs uh, the early evasive characters like Pegasus, Pegasus. and Sir Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps you'd like to get those online. Um, but that's kind of the difference here when you're on the play and draw. Yep. So Andrew inking the Bloodborne Ursula and having no turn one, which is kind of unfortunate. You definitely want to have that Curse Merfolk on turn one, uh, which Ben did have. Um, he does have that Flynn that he has on turn two, but unfortunately it put, puts him a little bit on the back foot, I think. Yeah, I mean, Andrew really, really wants a turn one play in this scenario. He has eight cards at one, which would help. Uh, he has the Magic Brooms, and he also runs the Schoenberg's Followers. And I can't remember if he runs two or four Schoenberg's Followers. One of these players runs two. But at the very least, there's six one-drops with strength. That would be a nice response to the Merfolk. Uh, but in this case, Ben bouncing the merfolk, this is a, you know, not only do we get a snake on board, but now we're going to be able to play the merfolk again, mm -hmm. and they're going to be able to quest a second time before being challenged and banished. Yes, that's one of the things I love about the bounce package with Madame Mim, is that you can quest with your characters and bounce them back just to protect them so that they aren't challenged by your opponent. And both players <laughs> that Andrew, line here. Yes, Andrew did too, um, with that Madame Mim Fox coming down. Yes. So we see, uh, Andrew says, I see your lore. I will also take two lore. And um, yeah, both players now, you know, Ben not being as aggressive, I'm sure, as he would like. Um, and it's kind of turned into, uh, yeah, a little bit of a back and forth here. Mm hmm yeah, these decks are really fun. Amethyst Emerald is a great combination, and I do think that it has kind of come to life here in absence of Bucky. Yeah, I do think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Rebecca, I do think we uh, that Flynn quested for two on Andrew's side before being bounced, so we should have uh, two lore with player one, I believe. I believe we should, okay. yes. <laughs> That's something worth noting. Um, but here we go, a little bit more wide here on Ben's side. Uh, again, with that aggressive line, the merfolk are back, and we have a sir, an evasive Sir Hiss in play. Mm -hmm. um, so Ben's going to be looking to kind of drive that lore total. And we have Madame Mim singing friends on the other side over here, getting that card draw, bringing out another cursed merfolk, and bouncing back. Mm -hmm. The Curse Merfolk, Kit Cloud Kicker. He, that was a card that I think was a little unassuming to me when it first came out in set three. But man, Kit has come in very handy, especially I think is a key card here in this deck. A wonderful card from Tailspin. You're right. People saw it. They said, I think this is good. And then when people started playing it competitively, they're like, wow, oh, this card is good. Really good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's exactly what Andrew <laughs> wants in this matchup. He wants cards to interrupt Ben's tempo, and he's done it to great effect here. Uh, look at Ben's side of the board here. He's on the play, and he's sitting on Justice or hiss. Um, so Andrew is starting to turn the corner here and maybe hoping to become the aggressor. We'll see how Ben responds. Yeah, and when you talk about deck archetypes in Disney Lurkana and other card games even, that tempo deck really is a, a deck that wants to keep the tempo up. You want to have a character come down every turn, and so a card like Kit Cloud Kicker or anything that disrupts that tempo um, can really make or break a game. And speaking of Kit Cloud Kicker, here comes another one. <laughs> there comes another uh, one. I'll play Merfolk, I'll play Kit Bounce Your Merfolk, I'll play Merfolk, I'll play Kit Bounce Your Merfolk, and here we have the mirror in its truest, truest sense. Yes. And Andrew finding his rabbit this game. Yes, again, getting this rabbit online is so huge in the mid game. And uh, then here's the merfolk back again. Now, in a lot of other card deck, or a lot of other decks, these one drop characters, you want them to come out on turn one or turn two, but you didn't necessarily want to see them later in the game. But I think Curse Merfolk is a little bit different. Yeah, it is. I mean, 
any so most of the time your first game characters provide utility early game they usually don't have a ton of lore uh, but any two lore character is always going to be welcome on the board especially in a deck where um, you're often going to be scrambling for you know your last four five six lore um, so playing it at any point in the game is helpful um, it's not necessarily a card you want to see all the time in the late game but it certainly is never a card that you're really really unhappy to play sure and we have a goat, our first goat of this match. Ben putting down that Merlin goat there, which gains him one lore when he comes into play. And then, of course, he'll gain one lore when he leaves play, whether that's banished or bounced back to his hand by his opponent or by one of his own characters. That's that's true. In this instance, um, you know, goat is often a card we see saved till later game uh, in order to bounce it and use it to you know to multiple fight to close out games in this instance i don't think ben had many other options but it also serves as a four strength character andrew has some interesting characters like rourke again which can come down and sit there for a while and do a lot of damage the goat is four strength um and it's a card that could be used a little bit offensively if ben needs to here but i also want to highlight andrew's hand andrew is sitting on sitting on an ursula deceiver and then the um the Ursula Floodborn. Um, and so one of the things he'll be thinking about here is can I, you know, at what point do I play the Deceiver and set up that Ursula shift? Yes, because uh, Ursula shifts for, for five or six? Uh, I think it's five. Gosh, yeah, the shift ability is just really fantastic. Yeah, she's a seven cost character normally, shifts for five. And we have a snake coming down to bounce back a uh, Curse Merfolk or get that rabbit going? I don't know. There's two good options here. Drawing the card is, is nice. That's probably the option. There it is. Yep. And it also heals up the rabbit too, keeps him healthy. And he draws into a Dawn Carnage. That's one of those cards that Andrew has in his deck that Ben does not. Yeah, this is a this is a fun card. So we uh, we haven't seen this very much competitively, but I'll, I'll hide another player. Uh, Zach Bivens is a very well known player. Actually, ran two of these as well um, in the main event in this exact deck. Um, so it's a card that's seen some play here, and um, we'll see if it's used to effect in this game. Also, a character from Tailspin with fantastic art by Luis Huerta. <laughs> Luis is a fantastic artist, um, great friend, uh, and uh, I love seeing his cards in the game. Absolutely. We have a couple of Sirhis. What's nice, too, about if he can get that Don Carnage on the board is then he'll have some answers for those evasive characters over there, the little baby Pegasus and the Sir Hiss. There are some other options, like we saw in last game, to take care of those evasive characters, but Don Carnage would also be a fantastic answer, also questing for two. It's a, it's a great point. So here we have the goat getting banished. That'll gain Ben one lore as it leaves the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Yep, keep those, you know, you might think, I don't want to give my opponent one lore, but it's better to give your character one lore than potentially two or three by bouncing those goats around. So good option there to remove it from the board. That's true. I personally love bouncing goats. <laughs> as an Amethyst player, I do as well. Yes. Uh, not so much when my opponent is... Is bouncing around. Oh, oh, there he is. There is John Silver. John Silver. John Silver, very powerful card. We saw it uh, used a bit in set one in this exact deck. Um, fell out of favor for a while, and now it's back in this build. Uh, when this card or character enters play and whatever he quests, you can give a chosen character reckless. And one of the things that makes it so good is that you, you get this effect upon him entering play. Not only that, but he's a 5-5 five, five body that quests for two lore. And in a game like this, we see this lore race going on. It can make a huge difference because every single turn you're preventing one of your opponent's characters from questing. Really fantastic card and fun to see him in this build. But here, Ben getting really close to, to finishing up here. Um, he has 16 lore with quite a bit of lore represented on the board. So Andrew's going to need to play something to slow down some of those ready characters as well. Uh, we can challenge into a few things, but those evasive characters, really a problem. We have three of them on the, blur, on the board. Um, John will provide an answer to one of them, but leaving two of them uh, able to quest unfettered is a problem. Ah, you could bring down a, a, a Lyle. That would, so now he has two characters that he could potentially make reckless. But Ben does have game on board if Andrew doesn't do anything. Of course, we know that he's going to be thinking through every possibility to remove as many characters as he can. I don't see how many cards are in Ben's hand. Does he have anything or is he top decking? I did not to see. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah. So I, I believe he is top decking, actually. Yes. 
So two characters there into the Ursula Deceiver with the rabbit and Kit. Yeah, we'll see something else get reckless here. Probably the peg. Nope, the Sir Hiss instead. We'll have to challenge. Mm -hmm. He still does have four ink in his inkwell available to him. Yeah, so we'll see. So now we have two more represented in the world. We're going to see a rabbit about to draw a card. I know here, so there, again, we talked earlier about the power of Rourke. So we do see Ben at 16 lore, which is a great place for an amethyst deck to be in, especially when goats are available. But as Ben is forced to challenge into Andrew's characters and and banish them, um, potentially, Ben is going to lose lore every single time one of Andrew's characters is banished. So he would love to get that John Silver off the board, for example, <laughs> yeah. but that's going to lose him a lore, and that one lore can make all the difference. So this is a really, really tricky spot to be in. Ben's trying to think about how do I, um, you know, I have to challenge. Where do I challenge to the best effect while calculating what this is going to do to my lore total and how much further it's going to take me from goat bounce range. What's nice for Ben is that Sir Hiss is a three strength, so he could potentially do quite a lot of damage here on Andrew's side of the board. So it's fun to, to mention, too, because Andrew made a choice not to give the Pegasus Reckless and instead give the Sir Hiss Reckless. Mm -hmm. And you'd think if you're going to, they're the same right in terms of lore total, mm -hmm. but Pegasus is obviously the weaker character, so it does less damage to your characters. But if you're sitting with Rourke on the board and perhaps you want one of your characters to be banished or two, you choose the Sir Hiss instead because there's no way for Ben to challenge in now without removing one of Andrew's characters, where before he could send both the Hiss and the Pegasus into John Silver and not banish one of Andrew's characters. Uh, that is really, really fascinating strategy. I hadn't thought about that. And... And Lyle did its job, and now he has lost lore here on his side of the board, which could make a, a big difference here in the, how this game plays out. Yeah, so Ben getting a card. Uh, did he get a card off a rabbit? Yeah, so one card in hand. And it's a Madam and Snake, Snake bouncing back the fox. He does have enough ink to, if you wanted to replay fox here, he could definitely do that. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll quest with the Pegasus. Now, you bounce the snake, and it doesn't have to challenge. But the only thing you can challenge into right now is that big John Silver. So... Yeah, it's... it's let's see. You bounce the snake, and, and now... Now you could challenge with Hiss and, and, and the Fox, Fox to... into the John yep. Silver. Yep. That, that is... That's the move. That's the move. That's the line. That's a great line um, given, you know, the options available. We do have the Pegasus now, and it's not much, but Andrew's sitting with two lore. You know, you're sitting with one lore that's going to be, well, I mean, ah, you do have work there, and Andrew has a full group of cards. It's still a challenging situation uh, for Ben, but uh, made the best of it. Yes, and now Andrew questing with both of his characters, going up to 13. So now we're at 13 and 14 here. Ben, of course, just having the snake. <laughs> Ursula, it's so funny. Or, yeah, Ursula Deceiver, when you play it, and you're like, I already know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's no songs. I already know. I'll, st there. I'll still take a look, because I'm Ursula, and I want to steal your voice. Yeah. Don Carnage into the Inkwell, Lyle, again, uh, coming into play, getting yeah. that reckless effect. Uh, we're going to take care of that Pegasus that way. Uh, that's actually another good thing I love about the bounce package, is you have so many characters that have these wonderful effects, but only when they come into play, and Lyle is one of them. And so bouncing him back and then being able to replay. I think Ben has called it, and game two goes to Andrew. Wow. wow. <laughs> Thoughts wow. on thought and see who's going to advance to the top eight here. Now, Andrew, again, talking about the advantage of being the higher seed in this day, uh, in this tournament on day two, uh, Andrew is on the play again. Um, so we'll have another chance to really drive the tempo and be aggressive. Let's see, we have a rabbit, we have a broom, we've got Lyle. I'm not sure if these are the cards he's keeping or that he's going to put back. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, I think him missing a uh, Curse Merfolk, we talked about that, that he missed his turn one Curse Merfolk, but I don't, it didn't end up making a difference there. No, I mean, the, well, the big thing Andrew wanted that game was was something to answer Ben's Curse Merfolk um, usually, and so not having that one drop we thought would make a difference, but able to recover pretty well from that. 
Um, I'm not surprised at the cards he kept. Uh, if I saw right, we did keep a Rourke, uh, which mm -hmm. will come down on turn three, make a huge difference when, uh, make a huge difference. We kept a couple brooms, able to, mm -hmm. to get down there in turn one, draw some cards, and then we did keep a, we did not keep the rabbit, okay. No. He did draw into that friends on the other side, but like you said, sometimes you don't even want to have friends on the other side on at the early game because of that Ursula Deceiver that may come down and snatch it out of your hand. That's true. We'll see how that plays out here. Um, kind of the reverse role here. Andrew, you know, normally you'd see Andrew want to play the merfolk and then Ben with an answer to take care of the merfolk. Here, the opposite. Ben is taking the aggressive line, um, forcing Andrew to respond. And I will say, too, um, the cursed merfolk feels really, feels good against the play sometimes because Andrew's already down a card um, and this deck can burn through its hand pretty quickly and so getting a merfolk on the board that your opponent has to discard to remove sometimes feels good. Instead, we see the snake come into play uh, protecting the merfolk and getting a bigger body on the board. Yep. Uh, he's thinking, yeah, Andrew's thinking, what do I want to play here? He's putting the uh, magic broom, I think, into the inkwell. Turn a bug into the inkwell and holding on to that magic broom and taking a look at Ben's hand. Couple Sir Hiss, Fox, that Maleficent where you draw a card, and the Cursed Merfolk. Uh, we did draw into a kit. That's a card that Ben is not unhappy to see at this point. But we have another turn three play. Let's see. Yeah, those Sir Hiss, I, I, they're really fun. <laughs> I do love evasive cards. Evasive cards are, I think, are a great, great deck. Here we go. So we had several plays available, including Recharging Heaven with Maleficent. Instead, we're going to go wide here and, again, try to drive the lore with that Cursed Merfolk and uh, that evasive Sir Hiss. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it may come down. It's just a race. Who can quest faster? Who can keep their characters on the board and quest to 20 first? Goat going into the inkwell on Andrew's side of the board. And do you think we see uh, Lyle make an appearance? I think we yep, will. There he is. I mean, this is the answer. Yep. This is a great answer to Merfolk um, as well. Mm. You can quest with one of your characters first, the Merfolk to challenge in. Of, of course, that works. Uh, unfortunately, Snake on the board, you know, if uh, Andrew exerts anything for those, those Merfolk to challenge into, um, that Snake is just going to clean them up first. So. Sure. Yep. Ah, uh, Merfolk. But Merfolk's is, a great card. This is a tempo play. I mean, preventing those Merfolk from questing a turn is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's going to slow Ben down um, and allow Andrew to find some bigger cards to get in the board and answer, answer Ben's board. We do have some interesting options here. We do have a Queen's Castle over there. That would be an interesting play at this point in the game. <laughs> and there it is. Yeah, they, they both have Queen's Castle, four copies, but we haven't seen any castles up to this point. Now, there, there are answers for Queen's Castle and Andrew's deck. Uh, it's really the fox or the fox-crab combo. Uh, but without the fox, and we do have the fox in hand, so there's a combination of cards we could use to take care of that castle. But um, it's, a, it's a great tempo play here because either Ben's going to gain some lore off this castle or Andrew's going to spend an entire turn and all his resources dealing with it, um, which then gives Ben another free quest next turn. And, and so it's a, it's a great tempo play against this deck. Queen's Castle, of course, being one of the strongest locations, I think, in the game still. That seven willpower is so powerful. It has two lore, um, and it almost feels sometimes like that card drawability on it is just like the icing on the cake. Right, um, yes. <laughs> at this point, but, but also able to get you some extra cards uh, if you can get it to stick around a little while. I also love the visual of, of cards exploring the Queen's Castle. The Queen's Castle, yes. Taking a look in the, in the magic mirror. <laughs> Who's the fairest location of them all? Definitely the Queen's Castle. So here we, uh, we go. Like you said, we're gonna we're gonna go all in here on the Queen's Castle with Rourke and Ursula, and then bring the fox down to finish it off. Yeah. So I mean, what this does, it gives you know a, an entire turn's worth of resources spent dealing with the castle. We don't get any lure off of it, um, but Ben now with his with his cards still in play. Um, able to force Andrew again to respond to whatever whatever he does. Yeah, like you've said, this tempo is so important here with both these decks and Ben able to keep up the pace and Andrew kind of lagging a step behind trying to, you know, really have, having to respond to everything that Ben is doing. 
Yeah, and there's also, uh, let's talk about efficiency, too. In these decks, they have a very similar card draw. They have very similar structure. And so one of the things in this game where you're kind of going back and forth and, and racing to a degree is who can use their cards most efficiently. Mm -hmm. So anytime you can trade two for one or remove one of your opponent's characters with yours, like removing the Ursula, which is not super threatening on its own, but it's a shift target um, with the snake, um, that feels good. And so it's all about efficiency uh, in this, at this point in the game. Yeah, and that's something with the shift ability in Disney Arcana is that you always have to think about that, knowing that there's those Floodborne Ursulas that could come down later as that the shift character. You have to think, well, do I want to risk leaving that Ursula on the board for that, or do I want to take care of that character now? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and speaking of that, I mean, that's, that's a big play. I mean, I don't think we've inked this turn. Um, so we would have five ink available, and were that Deceiver still on the board and not forced to challenge into the castle, shifting that Ursula is a line mm -hmm. available. I'm not sure if we would have taken it or not, but it's just an option we don't have anymore. So instead, Ursula goes into the ink well, um, and yeah. Yep, and we do see Andrew uh, has a Queen's Castle there in hand. And, and a friend's on the other side, so some nice card draw options. That's true, and a rabbit being played on Ben's side here. But we're going to strength our uh, quest with the three willpower, three strength snake, and uh, that's her hiss, which is evasive. And a merfolk to boot. And a merfolk to boot. Now, Ben doing exactly what he wants to do uh, at this point in the game, you know, questing aggressively, forcing Andrew to respond, and then choosing his moments to efficiently respond and remove his opponent's characters. Um, Andrew, you're on the defense here, um, hoping to draw into perhaps a John Silver would be a great card uh, to draw into here. Um, we have the ink to play it. Would love to have uh, a Maleficent, you know, shift and shift target available. Mm -hmm. Something to kind of uh, to give your opponent's characters reckless. Um, here we have a Lyle. That's exactly what we want to do in this scenario. Uh, probably pick the Merfolk. Yep, keep you from questing. And then choosing to banish that magic broom for drawing another card. We drew into a crab, which is not a terrible card to have in hand. And there comes the fox, bouncing your rabbit, draw an extra card. And the fox will remove the snake. It's, the snake has done a lot of shenanigans so far. There's <laughs> so many shenanigans. So. I mean, there's th that's that's the right word for it with the bounce mechanics, with the Merlins and the Mims. They're shenanigans. They really are. And it was actually the last shenanigans that Walt Disney saw. Uh, that's the last animated movie that was produced while he was alive was Sword in the Stone. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. What a kind of bittersweet fact. Yep. Uh, here we get a look, and there are two friends on the other side, so he can snag one of those out of there. Stealing Andrew's songs. Yeah, a card that, I mean, Andrew would love to... Andrew needs more cards. <laughs> so love to have those friends. Uh, unfortunately, friends in this scenario is a little bit of a... Uh, you, you really don't want to, if you can avoid it, uh, exert that Lyle um, yeah, because that yeah. Lyle is going to do work for you in keeping Ben's lore total suppressed. And so singing it is not the most palatable option in this scenario. Um, so Ben would love to, to have that friends, but would love to get a crab or, or a rabbit perhaps to stick first, able to sing it. Um, but definitely Cardi is going to want to use to draw into options. But Ben just going wide here, really pushing the lore total. Um, I mean, Ben is playing this game out perfectly so far. Both players are, but Ben with just the better options available. Yeah. And they both have fairly healthy hands as far as, oh, a Lucifer, that's fun. <laughs> oh, you were that. saying something about uh, healthy hands. Yes, yes, and uh, I was going to say, but he didn't necessarily have the card that he wanted for, you know, dealing with Ben's side of the board, but uh, Lucifer is fun. Yeah, this is one of the differences between this deck. There's one copy of Lucifer in here, I believe. Lucifer forcing your opponent to discard two cards uh, when it comes into play, or one action card. No action cards available in Ben's hand, and uh, so both cards go. And Ben is now in top deck mode with no rabbits in play. And so uh, this is kind of one of those moments where the momentum of the game, the tide of the game, can shift a little bit if Andrew's able to quickly uh, get some more cards on board and... And there's, there's a merfolk, merfolk at least. But we do have a kit which can also ruin uh, or slow down Ben's tempo a little bit. But Ben still, I think, not terribly upset about the board state. He's going to be able to push his lore. One, uh, two with evasive characters, two with the merfolk. Um, Six. Going to quest out here, pushing all the way to 14. Um, and it's it doesn't feel terrible, but the next few, oh that's a good that's a good top deck. That's, that's that that is nice. Yep, fourteen. So he has game on board, and Andrew is gonna have to make some decisions here. I mean, it's not the. 
best top deck in the world, but anything with two lore that can stick around when you're sitting at 14 lore is great. Andrew will likely not be able to respond to everything on that side of the board, especially with two, uh, just one evasive character, right? One Sir Hiss. One Sir Hiss over there, yep. Uh, no, two with a Pegasus, okay. So um, probably won't oh, be able Pegasus. to deal with both of those. We can kick Cloud Kicker one of them, um, but and Ben's going to be able to quest for at least a few more, and we're really within goat striking range at that point. So um, Andrew's going to have to to draw into something to really lock things down here in a moment. And giving Challenger plus three to the Cursed Merfolk. Choosing he not to play the Cloud, cloud Kicker. But what he's doing, so that, that was an option available. Instead, we're going to make efficient use of this because um, let's remember work there. Whenever one of your characters is banished mm -hmm. uh, in a challenge, how can we get work again? Yeah, we, that doesn't make a difference. Yeah, so it's just banished. Um, you, your opponent loses one lore. Yeah, so banished in, in any way. Yep. Each opponent and banish it anyway. So, so here, that's kind of the calculus is we could have bounced it back to hand, but instead, pulling that one lore away from Ben could be a huge deal. Um, and so, Lyle, you know, making a huge difference here. That's not a terrible top mm. deck at all. Love to see cards. that. And he drew into a goat, which is ah. huge at this point. Did you see the other card? I did not. Yeah. So here we are questing out. There's another five lore going to 18. Uh, we do have the goat. We could ink and play the goat. This he has a little Pegasus. Uh, nope. Maybe Pegasus instead. And so here's, here's an interesting fact. So without Lyle on the board, inking and playing the goat is basically game because the goat's either going to quest next turn or it's going to be removed. But Lyle changes that calculus, right? Because now your opponent is likely to banish one of their own characters uh, in response to the goat being played. And so saving the goat because it's information that Andrew doesn't have, playing another character on board um, is the proper play in this scenario. Yep, we're just going to... Oh, so he changed his mind. So he's thinking about Crab, but he used Rourke here to banish Curse Merfolk. And he's discarding... Did he already discard? He discarded the castle, I believe. I didn't see, but that would that would make sense. Something there. Goodbye to Ursula. Yeah, and the rest here are, <laughs> are evasive. That's true. Luckily, we do have that kit. That is a nice card to have uh, in this scenario. But, man, at this point, you're thinking, you're like, how do I best banish one of my characters? Um, because, oof. Yep. Yeah. Those evasives. Which we talked about the similarities and the differences between these two decks. And Ben, having those evasive cards in his deck was one of the key differences that we saw. Not only the Pegasus in the Sir Hiss, but he also has that Peter Pan. And Andrew saying, I don't have the cards that I need here to take care of those evasive cards. And so the game goes to Ben. Wow.